know this. Uh, uh, no, I don't have HDMI. No, no, <laughs> it's an old one. Okay.
Hello. All right. Good morning. So uh, we're going to begin the next uh, session. This session will be on improper ferroelectrics. We have four talks. The first talk is an invited talk and then three contributed talks. So I'd like to ask again that the speakers try to stay on time so we can keep a nice schedule and we can enjoy a full lunch break. So our first talk, uh, yeah, do we have the announcements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, a quick, quick announcement. So we're going to... Uh, break with tradition and actually have a group photograph. So it's going to be right before lunch. So, so after the last talk of the session, if everybody just quickly files out, I think it's going to be on the steps. Just go kind of straight ahead and we'll go outside and get a photograph <coughs> and come back in and it'll be pretty fast. So that'll be at noon. Okay, thanks. All right, so don't skip out. Get the photo after the morning session on the steps. All right, so our first talk uh, people are still filing in. Uh, we'll be given by uh, Mark Sen, and he'll be telling us about improper ferroelectrics, uh, negative thermal expansion in these materials. So can everyone hear me? So I'd like to thank the organisers for including me in, in the programme. It's very nice to be here and, and to talk in this lovely building. I think it's probably the nicest, uh, nicest room I've given a talk in ever. Um, so I'd like to tell you a bit about my work. I started looking at um, trying to understand the improper ferroelectric mechanism in, in exciting new class of materials, uh, which have been termed kind of hybrid improper ferroelectrics. And this work kind of involved into understanding another interesting physical property, negative thermal expansion, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about this story. And so I'm a crystallographer, uh, so my main motivation is, is studying you know, crystal structure, uh, and if you like studying complicated stri crystal structures, then you know, phase transitions are ideal, uh, and the, uh, understanding the complex physical properties which arise at, at these phase transitions is a big motivation in our work, and, and really my starting point always uh, with any crystal structure, you know, how much can I learn from this crystal structure? I don't just want to solve a crystal structure for the sake of solving a crystal structure, but I want to get as much physical insight as I can out of this. And one of the most productive ways to do this, and this is something we who, who work in ferroelectrics understand, is to understand the symmetry of the crystal structure. The symmetry of the crystal structure is related to the symmetry describing the tensor of the physical property you're interested in, and so this is a very productive way to inform the structural property relationship. Um, and, and that's what we're interested in doing. And then if you, if you worry, you know, once you accept that you can then learn a lot from a crystal structure, um, you know, essentially contained inside the crystal structure is the, you know, the, the ground state electron density, and with the correct level of theory, you can get out of the excitations, which inform you about all the properties arising from dynamics. Once you accept that, then you start worrying about, well, how accurately can we really determine these crystal structures? And we think even for very complex phase transitions arising due to charge ordering, orbital ordering, and, and charge density waves. We can really do this now down to one thousandth of an angstrom reproducibly, so really very accurate. So we're at the level where we can start to tackle these very, very complex problems. Uh, so, so this work anyway today is going to be talking about uh, hybrid in, uh, improper ferroelectrics, and because this is the first talk on improper ferroelectrics, I thought I'd give an introduction as to what uh, improper ferroelectrics are, so I apologise if this is a bit patronising 
to anyone in the audience, but I thought I'd just go through this so we're all on the same page. And, and also how I understand this in terms of symmetry. So I'm, I'm an experimentalist, I'm, I'm a chemist. Uh, I, I don't do DFT calculations. You know, I, I need to understand everything in terms of symmetry. This, this, is, this is my motivation. So I'll, I'll give you a kind of symmetry perspective on, on the trilinear term in improper ferroelectrics and, and hopefully... Uh, if you don't understand what, what, what the trilinear term is in improper ferroelectrics by the end of this talk, you, you will do. Uh, so <clears throat> this work uh, follows up on a very nice um, theoretical prediction by uh, Nicole Benedict and Craig Fenney on, on so-called hybrid improper ferroelectricity in these two materials. Uh, and although it partly validates this, we, we find some other interesting properties which emerge um, where, where our experiments diverge from a theory, essentially. But this, this is nice because this is work which has been, you know, been driven by, by theorists. Uh, so experimentalists are paying catch-up at the moment. Uh, and as I, as I said, I'm interested in understanding physical properties in terms of symmetry. Uh, and so you know, on, on the basic level, really, symmetry analysis is this, I guess. You, know, you have some high temperature structure where the, the average cation in barium titanate, uh, the, the titanium, sits on, on a mirror plane. Symmetry is not broken on average. Uh, and as you cool down, you have some kind of off-center displacement, and this mirror plane is now, now broken. Um, uh, and so you, you, you'd say something, if, if you're a physicist, you'd say this, this mirror plane no longer leads this, this polar vector invariant. Um, so, but actually, interesting, this is the example quite often we all give when we try to explain what ferroelectricity is. Of course, locally, this is probably not what happens in, in barium titanate. I think the, the weight of evidence now suggests that in barium titanate, it's more order disorder like, and, and this displacement, this distortion is actually rhombohedral like. Uh, so, in fact, this, if we applied this, this kind of very local symmetry analysis here to, to describing the macroscopic observed polarization, which is on the tetragonal axis, we'd actually get the wrong answer. Uh, and I'm also presenting a poster, which is just a, a recent contribution of ours to this kind of very long standing debate. Uh, and it's really just a demonstration of how. Global symmetry, which dictates the physical properties, can emerge from local symmetry breaking. So how local rhombohedral uh, off-center displacements of titanium atom, which are rhombohedral-like, could lead to this very rich phase diagram, which barium titanate has. Um, so, so come visit me at my post later on if you're interested in that. Anyway, for, for now, what I'm, I'm interested anyway in, in, in talking about broken symmetry. The picture I present there, of course, it's oversimplified. I've just represented the crystal structure as one unit cell, and then you have an infinite array of, of unit cells which build up the whole, the whole array of the crystal structure. So if I'm going to talk about breaking symmetry in, in a crystal structure, there's in principle an infinite number of ways to do this with this, this polar vector. Uh, and so a good way to think about this is in terms of, of phonon mode. So these are just the eigenvectors of, of, the, of, of the parent system. Uh, and so this is our, our ferroelectric zone-centered instability. But in principle, there could be other ways to break break the symmetry. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a useful way to classify broken symmetry in terms of frozen phonons. So if I talk about frozen phonons later on, or symmetry adapted displacements, I'm referring to this kind of analogy of, of symmetry breaking with, with phonon modes, which of course are, are dynamic, so the, the symmetry isn't broken on average. Um, and then, of course, the other thing you need to classify if you're going to break the symmetry, you've got the kind of character of the displacement. Uh, and you do this in terms of irreducible representations, and, and, and this is kind of, I'm not really going to go through this, but this is how an um, irreducible representation would work for a, a, a anti distortive displacement uh, with, this, with this wave vector, essentially. So when I start talking about, uh, uh, I give uh, labels later on which are x3 minus, the x corresponds to the, the wave vector, essentially, of this frozen displacement, and and the 3 minus corresponds to some kind of irreducible representation label, which you doesn't, doesn't have anything, it doesn't have a very you know, obvious uh, intuitive meaning, but you can go to a table and you can look up what the character of this x3 minus is. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm motivating this all slightly like this in terms of frozen phonons, because I'm going to go away and show how we can learn just not about ground state properties, something like ferroelectrics from, from doing symmetry analysis, which is something we all appreciate. We can also learn something about a dynamic property, so a property which arises due to the phonon density of state, state phonon dispersion. So I'm drawing this very deliberately, this very strong analogy between uh, broken symmetry and phonon, phonon, uh, frozen phonon modes. 
Uh, and, and indeed, these improper ferroelectrics, uh, they're good examples of, of soft mode phase transitions. Uh, so this, this analogy holds um, quite nicely. Uh, Uh, and so the, the systems I'm going to talk about, these are Rudolph and Popper Lab perovskite systems. Uh, so you always have your perovskite block here interspersed with a rock salt layer. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole family. You, you get up to n equals 3, and then the, in the infinity, you recover the, the perovskite layering. And, and essentially, n corresponds to the number of, of, of double la of, of layers of, of perovskite. So here you've got, got two, two layers. Uh, and so this talk will focus on, on this family here almost exclusively. Uh, and, and they're a very interesting uh, uh, group of families, so they, they, they house the superconducting, non, uh, unconventional superconductors, uh, ionic conductors. Uh, and, and as I said, this, this, uh, these improper ferroelectric phases, which I'm going to talk about. So this is, this is the paper which kind of piqued my interest in, the, in these materials and really got me into to working in improper ferroelectrics uh, by, by Nicole and Craig. Uh, and essentially... They, they describe the, the improper fer ferroelectric mechanism in this material in terms of two primary order parameters, so x2 plus x3 minus. These are just tilts of the, the octahedra, more or less rigid tilts of the octahedra in, in the proskite block. And these couple to a third uh, order, order parameter, uh, so a secondary order parameter, which is the polarization, which is an off-center displacement of, of cations. Uh, and this is a so-called kind of tri trilinear, trilinear coupling essentially here, drawn out uh, diagrammatically. And what they did is, on, in this, in this uh, energy surface diagram, they calculated uh, as a function of, of amplitude of, of these two order, primary order parameters, uh, the ground state DFT energy. And they showed that when these two are coupled together uh, simultaneously in the corners here, then you, you, lower the, you have the lowest uh, uh, ground state energy. Uh, and you also have a corresponding polarization, which develops, uh, and the sign of this is, is flipped if you only reverse the direction of one of these order parameters. Uh, so this is, this is really nice, and I, I want to understand what we could, you know, if, if we could validate this um, by doing crystallographic studies and how much we could understand about this in terms of the symmetry framework. Uh, and this, this is how I understand um, improper ferroelectrics and... and um, the, the trilinear term, and it's, term, it's in terms of the symmetry of inversion centers. Uh, so I've drawn here, uh, this represents a unit cell, and it's a, a paraelectric phase. It has an inversion center in the middle of the unit cell at, at high temperatures. Um, and the thing about inversion centers is they always come in pairs. It's kind of, a, this is sort of my favorite bit of crystallographic trivia. So in between this inversion center and that inversion center, which are related to each other by a lattice trans, tra translation, there has to be another inversion center uh, which relates the two to each other. It's, it's just, just you, you can kind of draw out for yourself and convince yourself that you always have to have two, two inversion centers in the unit cell. And so the way you destroy an inversion center uh, in a proper ferroelectric is you have a zone-centered uh, displacement, off-centered displacement, and this destroys both inversion centers simultaneously. And you, you have your, your ferroelectric phase. Uh, now, in proper ferroelectrics are different. The... The ferroelectricity rises uh, as a secondary order parameter, and here the, the uh, primary order parameter is invariably not a zone center mode. It's something which might have a periodicity like this, of propagation vector zero, zero, half, for example. Uh, and if I apply now a pattern of polar vectors, you'll see that one set of inversion centers is always maintained. So that just tells you by, by applying simply one antiferrodistortive um, pattern of, of displacements, I can never end up in the ferroelectric ground state. This can never happen, because I will always have inversion centers. Of course, I can change the origin of my, my anti-ferroelectric anti displacement pattern here, uh, and um, I maintain the other inversion center. And how do I get rid of both at the same time? Well, I couple two order parameters together. And because there now is no inversion center, there will be a polarization. And the further away we are from this symmetry, the more broken the symmetry is, the larger the polarization will be. Uh, so this is how you can understand it. The, the so-called trilinear term in improper ferroelectrics in, 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 um, in terms of, of kind of crystallography. Uh, and, this, and this, I should say, this is very general. I mean, 
really all, all, all improper barrel action mechanisms follow this kind of, kind of argument. Uh, anyway, so kind of back to, back to the main story. So the first, the first bit of work looks at, at the titanate, uh, rather than popper. Uh, and so I was interested in doing some, some diffraction. These are some powder diffraction studies to really study uh, the phase transition as a function of temperature. And the idea was to observe the phase transition. And then you could validate uh, certain ex uh, theoretical predictions about the nature of this so-called hybrid improper ferroelectric mechanism. So we want to see, is it, is it really second order? Um, do these two pro order parameters really couple together at the phase transition? Or does one order parameter come in first? And then do you see the second order parameter? Uh, and are they linearly dependent over a large temperature range? So one thing about improper ferroelectrics is that the polarization continues to increase linearly uh, after the phase transition uh, rather than plateauing out. Uh, so we, this is here now pla a plot of lattice parameters versus temperature along the bottom. And we thought we were in luck initially. We thought about 400 Kelvin. Yes, we've observed the orthorhombic tetragonal phase transition. And we can, we can go away and do some crystallogra crystallography and validate this. But actually... If you look at, if you, if you model the intensities of the data, uh, so, so with the structure factors, you see that the, the intensities of the weak superstructure peaks, which correspond to the, the, the supercell, which, which dictates this, uh, this ferroelectric symmetry, um, they don't change uh, till much higher temperatures. And here, here we think the sample's starting to decompose, or there's, there's some kind of phase coexistence. But... Although metrically these compounds look like they've undergone a phase transition, there is actually no, no phase transition, even up to 500 Kelvin. So, so that was a bit disappointing for us. Um, you know, the, the fact we couldn't kind of reach the phase transition without the sample decomposing. But what we can do is we can now refine the data and we can extract the amplitudes of these order parameters, so of these octahedral rotations and, and, and tilts here, the, the primary order parameters. And we can also calculate the polarization using just a point charge model. You know, we, we, we can calculate that from, from the crystallographic positions. And this just corresponds, in fact, to a zone-centered uh, polar mode, uh, the, the magnitude of this. Uh, and we see they, 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 they have a very nice linear dependence over a large temperature range. And the polarization does indeed increase uh, as a function of temperature. And this here just shows you what the, the different uh, order parameters look like. So the x3 minus is a tilt of the octahedra along the c-axis, and the x3 plus is a rotation when you look down the c-axis, and that, that's in phase. Uh, so that, that's some, some experimental kind of validation uh, of, of this mechanism, this, this so-called hybrid improper production mechanism. Um, but the system we really wanted to look at was, was the manganite, and the reason for this is that it's got a, a magnetic ordering, it's got weak ferromagnetism. You can't, can start thinking about... Um, how all this couples together with the magnetoelectric effect to give you something which might be useful multi uh, So this is the material we went after next. Uh, and this is, this is where the story kind of diverges, diverges from, from, from theory quite significantly. So firstly, at 300 Kelvin, you know, it was a complete mess of pattern. You, you had a phase coexistence in the powder diffraction pattern. You couldn't really fit, fit the data. Uh, you know, we looked at lots of different samples. It, we, we, all, we always had this, this phase coexistence. And actually, if you go back and look at the literature, uh, then a lot of people have reported these samples that they have really quite bad fits, the data at, at room temperature. So what we did is we warmed up to 500 Kelvin uh, and tried to fit it with the, the parent symmetry structure. So this is the power electric phase. Um, but you still observe some weak superstructure peaks, which are, which are not really fitting with this model. Uh, and OK, so, so maybe it's not gone through the phase transition at all. Uh, you try and fit it with this uh, ferroelectric space group, this, this model. Uh, and the fit really isn't, isn't quite good enough. And, and you know, you've, you've pumped a lot of extra parameters in here. This, this has got five free parameters you can refine to fit this data. And this has got 20. This model has only got six parameters. So you just added in uh, an extra one, or maybe extra two, actually seven, I seem to remember. Yeah. And, uh, you really get a very good fit to all these weak superstructure peaks. Uh, and so you might say, OK, so what? I mean, they've got slightly different space groups. What does this matter, really? Um, but I'll show you it has quite profound consequences for the, the science we can, we can extract from this. So it's not just a case of being a pedant about getting the space group right. We, we really can get some, something useful out of this. Um, 
So as I said, there's a, a phase coexistence, so we can refine the fraction of the phases as a function of temperature. And, and yes, indeed, at low temperatures, you do get this, this phase group, which corresponds to the, the ferroelectric phase. This has a very pronounced uh, phase coexistence, so over 100 Kelvin at least, with this ACA phase. And what really piqued my interest was that the, the thermal expansion along the C-axis is just completely different for the two compounds in the two phases. And it, it's quite surprising, really. I mean, they're essentially they're exactly the same structure. We've just got a slightly different tilt pattern in there. Why should the thermal expansion properties change so much when we've just augmented the structure a tiny bit? Uh, and so here you see that in the, in the ferroelectric phase, we have the expected positive thermal expansion, as we do in the titanate. But we've got this, this negative thermal expansion, which seems to rise uh, in its coefficient of thermal expansion up to the point we cease to observe it. So the motivation was to try and understand what's going on here. Um, and I'll just say something quickly about thermal expansion before we go on. So the kind I'm talking about arises due to, to kind of uh, transverse vibrations of soft modes, uh, modes with negative greenising pra parameters, essentially. Uh, and the kind of famous example is, is zirconium tungsten. state. And these are quite complicated structures, and there's a large number of modes which typically have negative greenising parameters, which, which, which contribute to the, the thermal expansion. Uh, what you really want to study, and the picture everyone draws themselves in a textbook is, you want to study a very simple structure which has got some rigid unit modes, uh, and the simplest one you can draw pretty much, a uh, three-dimensional structure anyway, is something like scandium fluoride. That's a, a proskite where you remove the acite iron and you can draw yourself a, a simple picture of what a soft mode might look like, which by some kind of tensioning effect would contract the whole lattice in on itself. So as you, as you populate this mode more with temperature and this amplitude gets bigger, you actually serve to contract the lattice. Uh, and so this is actually one of the only examples... Um, well, known, known for kind of simple materials like, like the proskites. And so it's quite interesting to study another system which is quite simple. I mean, it's about a layered proskite, try and gain some, some insight into, into the thermal expansion. Uh, and so it's, it's really a symmetry analysis which I think gets us to the bottom of what the soft mode is responsible for the, the unusual behavior in, in the ACA phase. So we start with the parent phase, and in the in proper ferroelectric phase, we've ended up down here. We've coupled these two order parameters together. Uh, but in this, the higher temperature phase, where we observe negative thermal expansion, we've just condensed out the single mode, uh, this x1 minus. Uh, and you'll see there's no group-subgroup relationship between these, which explains why you have this very large phase coexistence. Essentially, to have a phase transition between here and here, I have to go back up here, at least, which would involve unwinding this out-of-phase rotation of the octahedra along the C-axis. And then I'd have to condense back in the in-phase rotation and the tilt. And so what I'm missing here is I'm missing a tilt, right? I've got a rotation in both phases, but I'm missing a, a tilt here. And you can see the character of this, this tilt would lead, this is the C-axis going up, would lead to some kind of contraction of the C-axis as, as you populate this more. So my kind of hypothesis is, and you know, it's really just a kind of inkling. Uh, you know, I'm a chemist, so I like to come up with rules of thumb, and I use intuition, is that here we're missing uh, a, a, a mode, and so it must be there in a dynamical sense. It's not frozen out yet, so we, we've got this kind of tilt, which is, is present dynamically and is, is driving this, this, this negative thermal expansion. And the, the, this is, this is um, photon dispersion curves uh, calculated here. Uh, using the high symmetry phase, and this is just to show that these three modes are the modes which have the largest in imaginary frequencies. Uh, so so these, these are really the ones we need to worry about uh, in our model. Um, okay, so so because um, I'm, I'm a chemist, you know, I, I kind of want to go away and use this. This is you know a bit of intuition. I can say, okay, I've got this this idea that as I'm as so I've got these two competing phases, if I tune close to the, the, the phase composition, a competition, I'm going to enhance uh, the amplitude of, uh, of, of this mode, which is ultimately going to condense out and kill off the negative thermal expansion. So we went away and we made a phase diagram like this. We, we've doped the calcium site with strontium. Uh, and as you dope away from zero, initially experimentally, you observe the ACA phase, and then you tune all the way through 
the I follow them and then phase. And essentially, my hypothesis is we're only going to see negative thermal expansion here, and we'll suppress it here because no modes are unstable. We're, we're, we're stabilizing all the modes by injecting calcium into the lattice. And here we don't observe it because we condense out the, the soft mode, so it, it doesn't do any more work for us in terms of the thermal expansion. And this is really nice. This is exactly what we observed. So uh, for, the, for the lower x values here, we have uh, a negative thermal expansion. Uh, so I've plotted strain here and, and normalized at 300 Kelvin for various <laughs> experimental reasons. Um, so we have negative thermal expansion, and then as we switch off uh, the thermal expansion by going to the A21AM phase, then dramatically the thermal expansion changes. And also as we switch off the thermal expansion by tuning all the way through to X equals 2, so injecting a lot of strontium into the lattice, we, we switch off the negative thermal expansion along the C-axis. So this is a nice demonstration that, that this idea uh, has some validity. Um, and just to back this up here as well, uh, I'm showing the, the, the frequency, uh, which, which is imaginary, of course, um, calculated in, in the ACA phase uh, of, of the mode, which predominantly has this X3 minus character uh, as a function of X. And I'm also showing alpha, which is the thermal expansion coefficient as a function of X. And so as you increase x, alpha dies off. And this mode becomes less, less imaginary. Of course, this isn't, this isn't ideal. Ideally, you want to work with a mode which isn't imaginary. Um, but the thing about thermal expansion, uh, expansion is it only arises due to anharmonicity. It's only the anharmonic interactions. And it's precisely those anharmonic interactions which you don't capture when you do something like uh, DFTP and you, you calculate phonon dispersion curves. Uh, you don't capture this anharmonicity, and it's this anharmonicity which would, you know, in reality, give you modes which didn't have negative, uh, didn't have imaginary frequencies, but had, had real frequencies, of course. Uh, so this is a limitation of this here. Uh, and okay, so, so you know, the, the value is here is now you, you start thinking to yourself, okay, if I want to make another material which has got uh, this property, then I need to look for a similar kind of pattern of phase transitions. Uh, and if you go back through the literature, actually, and if you look at the Rudelson Popper 1, you find exactly this. So if, if, you, if you look at the Rudelson Popper 1, also crystallizes in this symmetry. And it has a kind of phase composition between this and this. And without even looking at the experiment data, I've pointed to this phase and said this will have negative thermal expansion. That won't, and that won't. Uh, so it's kind of developing a rule of thumb, you know, which you can work with. Uh, and this is exactly what we see. We, we went away, did the solid solutions. Uh, and get the thermal expansion out as a function of, of temperature. Uh, and, and as soon as you switch off here uh, into the I4 the MMM phase, you suppress the, the, the thermal expansion. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what I've given is a, is a you know, very qualitative description of how this mechanism might work. Obviously, we want to back this up with something uh, very uh, you know, much more quantitative. And this is, this is what Chris is working on. He's looking at. You know, how we can calculate this in, in a quantitative manner, the, the thermal expansion coefficients. Uh, and also looking at how general is this idea. So you know, we, we've got this idea that it's going to be general for these layer perovskite systems, but, but how, how general is this idea going to be in, in, you know, in practice? Uh, so symmetry analysis can teach us you know, about ferroelectrics. We know this, but it can maybe also teach us something about properties which are due to, to dynamics or excitations. <laughs> As such a negative thermal expansion. And this is chemists at least gives us some kind of predictive power. You know, we, we can go away and use this to, 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 to enhance properties and materials. Uh, and you know, I, I think this, this kind of uh, mode of investigation could, could be more general. Um, so I'd just like to thank you all for your attention uh, and to thank uh, all my collaborators and, and Chris and Sarah who've worked on this uh, and, and the collaborators Nick and, and Arash and um, Alexandra and Claire who supported me for a lot of the uh, crystallography at work at Dun Light Source and Sang Wu Chong and his group who, who made all the samples, uh, really high quality samples. Uh, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah, the first one. Yes, small comment. Yep. You see, uh, it's an interesting effect, mm -hmm. but it's very simple to, uh, to understand that if your soft mode is on the border of the zone, yeah. there's a pure ferroelastic. 
and they never, you get never negative expansion. But if your active mode is between center of, uh, you have a uh, common case of improper ferroelectrics, yeah. and then it's possible to show that it's possible to get mm, negative expansion from but symmetry group consideration. Yes. But this is, a, this is in a ferroelectric phase. So this is not related to, I mean, the fact that the, that the competing phase here is ferroelectric doesn't, doesn't really matter. The, the, the negative thermal expansion occurs in, in a phase which isn't, isn't ferroelectric. Uh, and in fact, in the Rolleston popper one example I showed, there, right, neither of these, none of the phases are ferroelectric. So the, the fact for the negative thermal expansion that the competing phase is, is ferroelectric is just coincidental. But it, in fact, it, it doesn't matter. You can draw a different diagram. Uh, so really, it's the idea of phase competition and, and having phases where um, you know, you're, you're stabilizing one phase over, over another phase for, for some reason, which we still need to work on is, is, is the key here. OK. Uh, sure. Uh, do you conclude from the loss of inversion symmetry on the fact that it is ferroelectric, or do we have any other evidence for ferroelectricity? Uh, so experimentally, um, and I think there'll be a talk on the, the strontium titanate, and maybe in, in two talks' time. Then they, they've measured the, the ferroelectricity. We, we measure it from the point of view of looking at the structure factor, you know, fit, fitting the data, uh, and we see that the, the zone-centered modes are active. Uh, you know, but are they going soft? They, they've gone soft already, so, so they're, they're frozen in. What, what we measure. First of all, strontium titanate is not ferroelectric, yeah? Not to get confused. This is the Rodderson popper. Yeah, it's but uh, no actually from the data, I didn't see any evidence for real ferroelectricity. You conclude from the data by loss of inversion symmetry, and I think this is quite well, general mistake to conclude loss of inversion symmetry is equal to ferroelectricity. Yeah. And this is calculated as far as I can see that, the polarization. Yeah, yeah. So the question is whether you can switch it. Well, it's switchable for electric, and there'll be uh, so Sang Wu Chong's group have done some really beautiful work, which will be presented, I think, in, in two talks. Yeah, time. in two talks there will be a presentation yeah. about this. Uh, and it, it can be switched. It wasn't clear. You're quite right whether this kind of for electricity could be could be switched, but uh, they've got a really beautiful demonstration of that. So. Okay, we have time for one more short question. Are there any other questions? Yeah, do. Uh, yes. Um, so in the titanate, you, you see them, so the, the A and the B and the C are plotted there, so that the C is on this axis and the A and B. Uh, and in the titanate, the A and the B are, are metrically very different. And that's what you expect, because you've got orthorhombic symmetry. Uh, and, and although they come together here, and, and you think, oh, metrically, I've got tetragonal symmetry, uh, in fact, the, the model that you have to fit is, is not, not tetragonal. Uh, you have to fit this disorthorhombic model. And, and this is a peculiarity as well in the manganite. So you look at the lattice parameters, and, and actually they, they look metrically tetragonal at room temperature. Um, but that doesn't mean the structure is, is, is tetragonal. And I think this is really due to very strong anharmonic effects in, in, in the lattice, that this is somehow driving uh, the lattice to, to appear metrically tetragonal. We, we don't really understand this. But. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll have to move on. Let's thank our speaker once again. <laughs> okay, so our next uh, presentation will be given by Stanislav Kamba, and he'll be talking about uh, high temperature electromagnons in Z type hexaferrite cobalt iron oxides and their ferroelectric soft modes in uh, barium manganite. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers to give me opportunity to, to give a talk here. There is a mic. I've got the microphone or, still. Hang on. Or I can speak here. I can see. Oh, fine. And uh, I, will, I will have a talk about two compounds because we have many new results. So I will speak uh, about uh, such... Uh, Rather complicated com uh, compounds, barium, strontium, copper, iron oxide, it's fine, I think, and uh, which crystallizes in Z-hexaferrite crystal structure. I will just show it. 
And uh, we, I will try to show you that you observe some spin excitation there. And uh, then I will switch to barium manganite, uh, which exhibits uh, improper ferroelectric phase transition, and we see nicely phonon anomalies and dielectric dispersion. There is a list of my colleagues from Prague who did the experiments, and also partially um, some microwave measurements were done in China by Ruyun Tang. And uh, samples, ceramic samples, were grown by uh, my colleagues near Prague in Resch and by Dabrowski uh, in Northern Illinois University. He did uh, barium manganite. So that is the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce you uh, magnetic structure, crystal structure, and magnetoelectric properties of hexaferrites. And, and then I will present mostly terahertz uh, data showing uh, spin excitations and uh, probably electromagnon activated due to dynamic magnetoelectric coupling. And in the case of barium manganite, uh, I will show you what happens near, anti, uh, near improper ferroelectric phase transition at 130 Kelvin. So this is Z-hexaferrite with, uh, you can see the chemical formula is, or unit cell is huge. It has 41 oxygens and uh, it is ferrimagnet below 700 Kelvin, which uh, changes to transverse conical uh, spin structure around 400 Kelvin, and in this, in this phase, uh, jaushinsky moria interaction is allowed, and, it, and then uh, polarization can arise in external magnetic field, which you can see here, that already in, at 10 millitesla, uh, we, have, uh, we, we can induce polarization, which can be induced practically up to 400 Kelvin, and but what is interesting, again, at higher magnetic field, polarization disappears, let's say, about two Tesla. This is due to change of uh, magnetic structure. Actually, without magnetic, without magnetic field, without external magnetic field, the spins are oriented along C-axis. And in external magnetic field, uh, transverse conical magnetic structure appears. And then due to inverse jaushinsky moria interaction, polarization can arise. And at, ma at uh, field above two Tesla, this magnetic structure is changed and, and then the polarization disappears again. What we found in terahertz transmission spectra, let's see here, it's, it's index of refraction, real part and imaginary part, and a frequency almost up to two terahertz. And we can see two excitations in losses, it's better to look on this. Uh, one excitation is at all temperatures up to 800 Kelvin. So we see this, this is probably phonon, which is present at all uh, temperatures. And at lower frequency, around 30 wave number, it's around one Tesla. Sharp excitation is seen, but it's uh, sharp at seven Kelvin, but on heating above 250 Kelvin, it disappears. And let's say at higher temperature, we see just some, some contribution from conductivity. This is measurements in zero magnetic field. Then my colleagues measured uh, terahertz transmission spectra in external magnetic field and at various temperatures. Here uh, is a spec our spectra at 50 Kelvin. Again, you can see uh, these two excitations. <coughs> in zero magnetic field, this is very sharp, this excitation, but with increasing ex magnetic field, this excitation is broader and practically it disappears above two Tesla. So this is, this is strong indication that it is spin excitation, which disappears when this transverse conical structure uh, uh, is changed to, to some other structure. And, uh, at low frequency, another new excitation appears in high magnetic field, let's say above two Tesla. And it, it's a nice resonance here, which 
changes. Here is a plotted its frequency versus magnetic field. And you can see it goes linearly up and can be a nice fitted. Uh, and this uh, slope, this pr proportion factor, it's a geromagnetic uh, factor. It's known such behavior for ferromagnetic resonance, which is in zero magnetic field somewhere in gigahertz range. It is practically at one gigahertz. But in this scale, it is at zero frequency. But it comes in our terahertz range uh, in, uh, in high magnetic field. So we have here two spin excitations. This is ferromagnetic resonance. And this, this uh, we, we believe that it's uh, electromagnon because we don't see this excitation in single crystal in hexagonal plane polarization. So if we, it means that this excitation is active only if we apply electric field of uh, terahertz radiation along C axis. And this excitation is present as well up at 250 Kelvin, but it's very broad. And again, it disappears in external magnetic field uh, above two Tesla. And this ferromagnetic resonance is present here, same like here. It's uh, exactly, they are both data at 50 and 250 Kelvin exactly at the same frequency. Uh, why we believe that we have an electromagnon? Actually, you can have a spin excitations, which can be called classical spin excit or spin or such magnons contributing to magnetic susceptibility. But in the case of dynamic magnetotry coupling, uh, which can arise from three different mechanisms, from magnetos addiction, from chaushinsky moria interaction, or from second order uh, spin orbital coupling, then you can activate magnons not only from Bruen's own center, like his classical anti resonance, but you can see as well some spin wave this Q vector outside of Bruen's own center. And in the case of chaushinsky moria interaction, we, we activate the magnon with modulation wave vector of the spin. This is usually seen in spiral uh, magnetic structure. And uh, when we have high magnetic field and this, uh, this, this modulation of spin structure disappears, then this, this electromagnon is also uh, no more seen in, in our terrar spectra. Okay, let's go now to barium manganite. Barium manganite, it looks like perovskite chemical formula, but it's not perovskite. It, in this case, we have oxygen octahedra uh, with uh, sharing uh, phases. Of, and so the crystal structure is shown here. It's hexagonal, this is space group in paralytic phase, but it is non-centro symmetric. And uh, at uh, 130 Kelvin, uh, improper ferrotic phase transition occurs, which was recently published by Stanislav Chuk two or three months ago, and Marignon and Goze predicted it two years ago or three years ago. So there is a tripling of unit cell due to uh, softening of phonon at Bruen zone boundary at this Q vector one third, one third, and zero. And uh, so you can see here lattice constant in A direction is like this. In C direction, there is also uh, negative thermal expansion. And when we, okay, we, we did as well such X ray measurements and we obtained the same da data like Stanislavchuk. And, uh, but uh, what is new when we measured dielectric properties from 8 kilohertz up to 6 gigahertz, you can see at high, at high temperatures and low frequencies some dispersion due to Maxwell-Wagner and conductivity is not important, but at the higher frequencies there is constant permittivity. It's not changing at all. At 6 gigahertz it is it's also the same, only small uh, change is here, it is due to, it is within accuracy of measurements. But what is interesting that at, at uh, ferroelectric phase transition, there is no peak, like we know in classical displacive or, or in, in, in classical proper ferroelectrics, but there is just change of, of uh, slope or in temperature dependence of permittivity. And permittivity is increasing, and then we have something like uh, 
black sulfurotic behavior. And at 6 gigahertz, again, we have as well such increase. So where is it coming from? Is it relaxory at low temperatures, or what is it? Polarization is uh, rather small. It's 1,000 times smaller than in barium titanates, but it is measurable. And uh, when we measured, this is hysteresis loop here, slim, but in, uh, from pyrocurrent, one can see also changes of polarization. But uh, one has to say as well that it's disappearing, the polarization higher at the 130 Kelvin. It depends at which temperature first we pull the sample and then cool down. And uh, there are also probably some defect contributions to permittivity. But hysteresis loop is seen well only below 100 Kelvin. It is also magnetic, uh, antiferromagnet, below 60 Kelvin, so it is multiferroic. And, but the uh, magnetization is changing quite unusually. It's, it's not increasing like in classical antiferromagnet, but we have just decreased, and there is some, some anomaly around nail temperature, and then increase. Uh, this unusual behavior is due to short range magnetic order above magnetic phase transition. One can see it in EPR spectra that uh, intensity of EPR resonance is drastically decreasing below 230 Kelvin, giving evidence for such short range magnetic order up to 230 Kelvin. In infrared spectra, this is spectrum of, th of ceramics, uh, at different temperatures, and practically we don't see any changes. It's quite surprising because uh, in, para in para electric phase, we expect this red one are polar phonons. We must uh, make minus two acoustic phonons. So we can expect seven polar phonons in spectra. And in ferrotic phase, we can expect 23 polar phonons. Due to tripling of unit cell, we have much larger unit cell. And practically, we don't see any new phonons. Only, also in Raman scattering, uh, we see seven modes which are allowed from, at, uh, at high temperatures, which are allowed from paralytic phase, but at low temperature, we see only two new modes, this one and this one. Uh, and this is at very low frequency, below 25 wave number. And when we did the terahertz transmission measurements, you see in permittivity and lo dielectric losses, strong resonance very narrow at low temperature, but on heating to ferrotic phase transition around 130 Kelvin, it's softening and disappearing. It, it, it is shown here frequency versus temperature. So it follows Cochrane law very well and disappears at 130 Kelvin. This is the soft mode, which is, which is originally in paralytic phase at Bruen zone boundary. It's not active in paralytic phase, but when we have this uh, tripling of unit cell, we have folding of Bruen zone, and this uh, phonon, originally soft in paralytic phase, it comes in Bruen zone center and it becomes infrared and Raman active, and, it, it, and then on cooling, it's nicely seen. But it's at very low frequencies. And in this case, the scale is rather large, so we can see like strong, but it is rather weak in comparison with reflectivity spectra. Uh, here, uh, other modes are m one order of magnitude stronger. So, so the, the distortion, even if you have tripling of unit cell, it's rather small because, because this uh, crystal structure is very, very, d um, very strong and it's, it does not like distortion because uh, octahedra are sharing the faces. So it's very difficult to, to distort it. So practically we don't see new phonons, but uh, only at low frequencies we see this new mode because in, in this case we are much more sensitive. Uh, five minutes more? Five minutes okay. So in, uh, how is it, wh where is it coming from this permittivity increase? Look here that change of permittivity due to phonon softening is just small. It's less than 0.5. And here we have increase eight, it's much larger. So 
it does not explain completely this change of permittivity at, uh, on its, at this improper ferrotic phase transition. We need additional <coughs> mechanism contributing to permittivity. And this, this, I believe, is a domain wall motion. We have ferrotic domains below TC, and, and they uh, contribute to permittivity in microwave range. And at low temperature, domain wall motion is freezing. And therefore, we have something like domain, uh, like relax or uh, ferrotic behavior, because we have broadening of distribution of relaxation times and freezing. So permittivity from phonons, it will be like this here up 14, but this is contribution of domain wall motion. Uh, so summary. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have the time to speak about mic uh, microwave properties. Who would like to know it, I can show you during coffee break. Uh, I wanted to show here in, uh, he that in hexaferrite, we can see nicely uh, spin excitations, which are both magnet, uh, which contribute both to magnetic permeability and dielectric permittivity, so magnons and electromagnons. And in uh, barium manganite, uh, we see anti, uh, oh, this improper ferrotic phase transition in permittivity in ch phonon changes. By the way, Stanislav Chuk, who, did, who published three months ago uh, his paper, they as well measured infrared spectra using uh, infrared ellipsometry, and they saw as well some phonons on single crystal, but they did not see very well phonons outside of Bruin zones or, or in C, C direction because they measured mostly in, in, in AB plane. And also they did not see the soft mode below 25 m number. So this phonon soft mode is finally both infrared and Raman active, and, but additional dielectric relaxation is necessary for, exp for explanation of the dielectric dispersion. Thank you for your attention. Great. So we have time for one or two questions. A phonon. You you asking about magnetic uh, about magnetization for the electromagnet when when you increase magnetic field at one point it, it decreases and then disappears. So does this strength of this electromagnet given to something else like a phonon at higher frequency? Uh, it should be, uh, but uh, the intensity of this electromagnet is rather weak in comparison with the uh, intensity of phonon. So, uh, look like that there is some. It, there must be some transfer because there is a sum rule for dielectric strengths, but uh, it is so weak, so we cannot directly see it. Yeah. But it should be. Thank you. You are asking about barium manganite or hexafluoride? Barium manganite, yeah. So I want to know what, what happens when, when there is on table magnetism. There is, uh, there is okay, on table magnetism is between 50 and 60 uh, Kelvin, and in still here, the phonon is very broad, so it's difficult to see some, some <coughs> something related with the magnetic phase transition. but. Uh, we thought at the beginning that this, this can be as well spin excitation. So my colleagues did as well terahertz measurements in external magnetic field, and there is no change. It's stable. So it is phonon. Okay. <coughs> One last question then. <coughs> in the hexaferrite, I might have missed it. Did you Were you able to do some... Um, uh, polarization uh, dependent measurements on the electromagnetic intensity on the incoming wave and see how that depends on the polarization of the, particularly the electric field vector of the incoming wave. Uh, I do not understand it properly. We were able to measure change of polarization. Uh, what I showed before was published uh, result, but my student did uh, measurements uh, as well on ceramics 
And in this case, you have to, you have to measure pyrocurrent in external magnetic field, practically. Okay. Uh huh. Yes. Uh -huh. You mean in uh, with respect of external electric field? Yes. This would like we would like to do, but it's. Uh, there is in literature only one paper. Uh, studying electromagnon in external electric field. We did the measurements in the external magnetic field, but not in electrically active. That's true. It means that you have to measure uh, polariz all terahertz polarization with respect to all crystallographic axes, and then you can dis distinguish whether it is contribution to permittivity or permeability. In our case, uh, we had ceramics, or we had a single crystal which was very thin in C-axis. C -ax, C so uh, in AB plane, we don't see this electromagnon. So this is signature. It should be, po it should be active along C-axis. OK, so with that, I think we'll move on. Let's thank the speaker once again. Okay, the next presentation will be given by Fei Ti Huang, and she'll be speaking about domain topology and conducting ferroelectric walls in a hybrid and proper ferroelectric. Um, hi everyone, I'm Fei Huang from Rutgers University, and today my topic is domain topology and conducting work in hybrid improper ferroelectry. I also add a little bit domain uh, switching kinetic in the end of my talk. And before start, I want to thank uh, my colleague at Rutgers University and uh, the Professor Chen and Professor Rodney uh, for the calculation help. So um, in perverse sky, here is showed the common structure with the PNMA structure. <coughs> and the octahedral distortion will cause the antipolar A side displacement, which usually suppress the federal electricity. And bending a family, this based on the first, princi first principle calculation, they suggest there is a, a unique type Couple, trilinear coupling of octahedral tilting can cause uh, a normal form of ferroelectricity called hybrid improper ferroelectricity. So one of the idea is we can use this PNMS structure as the building block to turn anti-ferroelectric into fairly electric as long as one can create an in equivalent environment for the A side, for example, we replace uh, alternating AO layer into A prime O layer in heterostructure. structure. And this cation ordering concept can extend to bulk material like a double proboscide, dual Jackson phase, and Rutherford proper phase with even layer. So for example, this 327 structure, and today I will focus on this structure. It's a quasi two dimensional structure with implant polarization. So uh, our group are able to grow high quality single crystal on um, pure calcium titanium oxide and also with different strontium doping. And here shows is switchable at room temperature. And in plant PFM, uh, piezo response force microscope image, it reveal uh, intriguing 
ferro electric domain, and those black and, and white arrow indicate the polarization direction. So charge war head to head and uh, tail to tail. Uh, usually energetical unfavor, but are mystery abundant in this compound. And from the conducting map, the domain war compared to the domain can exhibit large conduction. This is very exciting but unexpected. And the result is uh, are very reproducible in different batches and strong cell doping. If we go to a high magnification using dark field transmission electron microscope, here I call dark field TEM, we see more domain. There is always three domain merging at one point to form a Z3 vortex. And the reverse contrast by taking opposite uh, diffraction spark for imaging. So those indicate that they are ferroelectric domain. And if we match the color, if we match the color with the PFM, in fact, those antiphase domain are invisible in PFM technique. So TEM result tell us each polarization is degenerate with two antiphase domain. So there should be a domain state in total in 3 to 7. And here I want to show a mosaic dark field TN image in covering three also home big twin area. And then we see the also home big twin, a self-organized Z3 pattern is very clear. You can see the Z3 vortex, vortex here. And then within the twin, also home big twin, there is always two up polarized domain and two down polarized interface domain. So what is the origin of this interface domain? And we need to look back to the structure. And in my follow slide, the structure was described uh, with respect to QB ethics. And for simplicity, I call diagonal direction to be one, two, three, four quadrant. So there are two characteristic uh, distortion in 3 to 7. The first one, we call it octahedral rotation. The rotation axis is along B C axis pointing out of the screen. So rotation can be positive clockwise or negative counterclockwise. And the second one, it can be octahedral tilting. So uh, the tilting axis is in plane 110. <coughs> A clear feature is the red sphere, the apical oxygen, will move toward one, two, three, four uh, quadrant. And a combination of rotation and tilting can produce a direction for this apical oxygen motion. So for the clockwise, we call one plus, two plus, three plus. And for the counterclockwise <coughs> rotation is one minus, two minus, three minus, four minus. So we have a state. And uh, by defining the apical oxygen motion, we can uh, construct the corresponding polarization. So here, sure, antiphase domain can be found instead like a one plus, three minus. They have identical polarization, but structurally, they have a translation vector. And this is very easy from our notation because tilting and rotation both change sign in antiphase boundary. And on the other hand, if rotation, only rotation or tilting change, it will produce a 180-degree ferroelectric relation. For example, 1 plus mi 1 minus. So the do domain wall between these two states, these two states we call FER, rotation-driven ferroelectric wall. So it's between the two domains have the identical tilting, but opposite rotation. And FET, tilting driven wall, is a domain wall between two domains have uh, opposite uh, tilting and the same rotation. And these two row, the relation is 90 degree difference. So in fact, we also have two types of ferroelastic wall, FA wall, FAT and FATR. So I want to have your attention that 
FATR and interface boundary, in fact, is the world between two states that tilting and rotation both change side. So based on the understanding of structure, we have A domain state and the five types of domain wall. So we go back to TM image. Now it's clear these two in interface boundary and one plus and three minus state. And domain three, it can be one minus and three plus because it's 180 degree relation. So we need to think about the domain wall. And experimentally, we can identify interface boundary without ambiguity. And we found across, uh, around these Z3 these vortex, there's always two types of wall. One is narrow shaft, narrow shaft wall. Another is the, with a relatively broad contrast. Since uh, strain provide the diffraction contrast in Duffield TN, so we also associate this uh, narrow wall to be FET with less uh, autohedral mismatch. And the other, the other one will be FER, rotation driven wall. So now we can make up all the full assignment of domain and domain wall in this. Uh, 327 system, and the main message is uh, within the orthohombic twin, we observe these three vortex, and across the orthohombic uh, boundary, we also observe these three vortex with the FATR and FAT domain wall. So um, I make a quick uh, Summary that a simple Z3 valence graph can describe the domain state in this hybrid improper ferrule tree. And uh, we believe uh, this coherent neck wall with curly shaped domain is responsible for this abundant charge wall. And here I want to discuss about uh, the energy hierarchy in among these five domain wall, if we assume a wall going through the cubic oxygen position will cause more energy, then we can get this uh, domain wall relation. <coughs> and this is consists with uh, the statistic uh, population obtained from phase field calculation. So first, uh, we can see uh, these three vortex in the simulation. And a uh, uh, comparable population of two FE war and uh, one fellow elastic war suggests interface boundary and FATR, they are belong to a uh, higher energy set. And then across the orthohombic twin, the rotation of the parameter tend to be unchanged. So it produces this low energy FAT war. But um, I think the energy difference should not be large because experimentally we observe five types of domain war. And in reality, the atomic configuration across the world may be complicated because the inverted width and uh, the rotation may be changed. So uh, it would be nice to have more theoretical input on this issue. So in my last part, I will talk about our recent result on the domain switching kinetics. So there are two questions. First, how switching occur in this uh, A, domain, A domain state and five types of domain world? And second, can we observe 100, 180 degrees switching, 90 degrees switching, and then is there any intermediate state during the switching process? So uh, in situ polling by using Duffield TN technique is uh, a phase positive charging at a local thin area by the focused electron beam and with the slow reduction of infected electric field due to the charge dissipation after defocusing the beam. So that means if we want to see in situ polling, we need to uh, acquire Duffield TEM image 
immediately before the charge are completely dissipate. So here is short the initial state, the green line is interface boundary between two interface domain. They show the same contrast. And uh, in situ polling at five o'clock direction, at the sample age, we observe a directly 180 degree switching by the bright contrast into a gray four plus domain. And uh, this induced four plus domain shrink slowly due to the after defocused beam. Let me start again. So this video showed the process of the charge dissipation. I want to have your attention that this wavy wall move readily under electric field, and this is ferroelectric rotation wall, and this is the original interface boundary direction uh, location. So uh, we make up the domain state and the, the domain types. And this induced four plus uh, return to the initial state four minus uh, 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 domain. So um, our idea about this polling process is one segment of interface boundary can split to two ferroelectric wall, FET and FER. And remember, anti-phase boundary are associated with discontinu discontinuity of rotation and tilting. And this FET tend to, with higher energy, tend to be pinged by, uh, at the original anti-phase boundary location. And the FER, the wavy domain, tend to be mobile. And this process is reversible. And this is also consists with uh, the energy hierarchy we discussed before. And the final, interesting, we also can observe 90 degree ferroelectric switching. So here show another regime uh, with two interface boundary, the same contrast and interface domain in between them. And then by focus beam at the sample edge, we induce a perpendicular to polar axis uh, electric field. We observe a black triangular domain. So from the bright two minus to this black three minus domain, this domain contrast is the same with the neighboring fellow electric domain. So a directly 90 degree switching is observed here. And this induced three minus were back to the initial state after charge dissipation. So we can also induce 100, 180 degrees switching at the same location. So I want to show you that TM is able to tell the 180 degree or 90 degree domain by the contrast. Here is gray color and black color. So um, here, process is interface boundary can split a collective uh, under electric field to become two low energy, two fellow elastic wall. Here is FAT and FATR. And this process is also reversible. So it's quite amazing. Interface boundary is just like a zipper like when you apply electric field, it can split. And then you remove the electric field, they will become a, a, they were correlative. So uh, my conclusion is, um, we I show you uh, we can observe eight types domain with these three vortex and uh, five types of domain work, and you sh you form a very simple three valence graph for a domain structure. 
And then second, we can observe the 180 degree and 90 degree switching, and we didn't see any intermediate space. And most interesting thing is interface boundary, just like a zipper-like nature, can expand to two lower energy uh, ferroelectric or ferroelastic or in response of the electric field. So there are still many interesting issues um, and questioning about hybrid improper ferroelectric, and we hope the, uh, our work in, can inspire more dynamic study on this uh, hybrid improper ferroelectric. Thank you. Okay, we've time for one question, maybe a short one. Yeah. I would like to ask you a question. <coughs> so, in your crystal, if you prepare your, I understand that you investigated bulk crystals, but if you prepare films, the same material in, in the nanoscale, monocrystal films. What do you think? Will you observe domains? I think the so because- The switching will be caused by domains. What do you think? I think it will be the same because this is in-plane polarization. This structure is already quasi-two-dimensional. So even it's a thin film sample, I think it will be very similar. No, I mean the thin film is the nanoscale, approximately a few nanometers, and so comparable with critical nucleus of the main. There's a switching, but what, what is it? Oh, the probably the domain were moving. Domain there were no moving. Domain. Maybe we can uh, save this for a lunchtime yeah. conversation because no I think it's a little detailed. Uh, any other? Comments? Yeah, w one more. Uh, I'm actually okay. just uh, kind of a representative of what is the magnitude of the electric field for the application of the crystal and the energy dissipation for agricultural processes? Um, I cannot answer the question here because uh, what I did is not very quantitatively. We are going to do a real in situ TEM, then we can really control the electric field. But in this part, it really depends on the sample thickness and then the, 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 the shape of the age. So I couldn't get this value, right. Okay, let's thank our speaker once again. The reminder, don't skip out early for lunch. We're gonna take a photograph after this last talk. Uh, the last presentation will be given by Zhu Zhen Lu from Northwestern, and he'll be speaking about first principle study of the layered oxides with hybrid and proper ferroelectric. Okay. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Xue Zhong Lu from Northwestern University. Uh, first, I would like to thank, uh, thank my advisor, Professor uh, James Rondinelli, for his instruction and uh, supporting me to attend this meeting. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, my work on first principle study of the layered oxide with the hybrid improper ferroelectricity. The, re the report is organized into five parts. First, I will introduce the uh, architectural strain engineering of the, in the complex oxide. Second, the second is, uh, is an unusual um, finding that is uh, uh, strain-induced polar to non-polar transition in the uh, layered oxide. 
And in this presentation, I will use the blue color to indicate the uh, P uh, polar state and the pink to indicate the uh, non-polar state. Um, th uh, then I will uh, talk about the driving force for the transitions in induced by the strengths and uh, the added functionality from a uh, uh, polar to non-polar transition. Uh, finally, I will briefly summarize my report. Um, Student engineering uh, is a powerful tool to uh, generate and uh, tailor the functionality uh, in the complex uh, oxide. Uh, 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 it, the string can make uh, previous re re reports show that uh, show that the uh, uh, the string can make the nonpolar material uh, nonpolar materials become uh, polar. Uh, if it is already polar, it, uh, the compressive string will uh, favor the out of plane uh, uh, polarization and the tensile strain will favor the in plane polarization. Uh, all the, uh, and these phenomena are due to the strain polarization coupling. Uh, recently, the strain, uh, the strain effects on the octahedral rotation uh, have been uh, intensively studied. Uh, due to the strain octahedral rotation coupling, the, uh, the compressive strain will uh, favor, uh, will favor the uh, out of uh, will favor the out uh, out of plane rotation, and the tensile strain will favor the uh, in plane of uh, in plane octahedral tilt. Uh, and also, furthermore, uh, uh, the the band gap uh, because the band gap is uh, coupled to the octahedral rotation, um, which may uh, lead to more interesting phenomena such as uh, strain tunable metal insulator transition or uh, the magnetic reconstruction. Now we, we know the strain, uh, the strain can induce the, uh, can uh, influence the polarization, uh, it, it, it let it appear or, or enhance the already existed ferroelectricity. And we also know the uh, strain uh, can, have in, uh, can have effects on the octahedral rotation and cause the metal insulator uh, transition and uh, the uh, 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 magnetization reconstruction. But when the uh, polar mode and the AFD mode are uh, simultane uh, simultaneously uh, exist, exist and uh, are coupled with each other like, the, uh, like a trilinear coupling here shown here, what are the uh, what are the effects? This is what we have we have done in this work. Um, here here shows the uh, two dimension uh, two uh, primary other parameters uh, uh, define the phase uh, space. The Q one uh, Q Q one uh, represents the octahedral uh, rotation, and the Q two represents the octahedral, octahedral uh, tilt. Uh, in this figure, the blue line shows uh, represents the uh, the experimentally found the CMC21 uh, ground state structure and previous result, uh, previous study in the calcium magnet shows showed that uh, there in this in this phase there exists uh, there exists uh, there exists there exists uh, uh, three modes they are uh, x2 uh, plus octahedral rota uh, ro ro rotation uh, rotational mode and x3 minus octahedral tilt mode. Uh, which are the uh, soft mode and the uh, gamma five minus polar mode, which is which is a uh, uh, hard mode. And th the important finding in this work uh, uh, is that even though the gamma five mode, gamma five minus polar mode is hard, it can be finally condensed uh, with the co uh, coexistence of the x two plus and x three minus mode uh, due to uh, the existence of uh, uh, a trilinear coupling among these three modes. And here we uh, pose a question whether uh, if other phases may appear when strain applies. To answer this question, uh, we, uh, take the, we, take, we, keep, we take the calcium magnet as an example, which is similar to the CMO system, and its hybrid ferroelectricity has been uh, has been dem demonstrated by a recent uh, experiment. Uh, our work is based on the DFD, uh, additional functional uh, distance functional calculation. 
uh, calculations uh, by using the WASP with the PAW method and the PBE solid functional, and these are the values. Uh, these are the electron valence configuration, configurations for calcium and titanium uh, oxygen uh, in the uh, CO2 potential. To simulate the 001 film, uh, we use the implant lattice vector shown here. And the AS is the string uh, CO2 uh, tetragonal lattice constant. Uh, and in the calculation at each string, we, uh, the AB are fixed and the C all and all internet, uh, internal atomic positions are fully relaxed. We first use the uh, genetic algorithm uh, structure search method to look for the ground state, ground state structure at each stream. Um, here, here shows the 10 lowest energy structure at 0% uh, from the GA method. Uh, method. Uh, we find the uh, ground state structure is uh, uh, at 0% stream is a polar CMC, uh, CMC21 symmetry, which is uh, consistent with the experiment. Next, we, uh, we, we uh, at uh, minus four percent stream, we uh, our G method find a new uh, a new ground state structure that is a, a, a nonpolar uh, PBCN symmetry. Uh, we, 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 uh, and in this phase, the uh, the Q uh, the X two plus rotational mode is changed in CMC two one. It changed to the uh, X one minus rotational mode. And, the, and and the, the, um, this phase has a larger uh, uh, has a larger rotational uh, angle uh, at four percent stream. Uh, the, this new phase uh, was also uh, is also found to be the ground state structure, uh, and it has a larger, uh, much larger uh, tilt angle. We then, we then calculated the whole phase diagram for the zero zero. Uh, CTO films, um, we find the CMC21 phase can be stabilized in the three region from minus 3.3% to 2.6%. And out of, this, uh, out of this region, we, uh, the uh, PBCN phase uh, occurs, uh, so, uh, so leading to the P uh, polar to non-polar transitions. Uh, and in this, uh, PBCN, uh, in this PBCN phase, uh, the X3 the X2 uh, plus, uh, the E phase out X2 plus uh, rotational mode is changed to the, uh, X, uh, the out of phase rotation, uh, X1 minus rotational mode, and the gamma 5 uh, minus polar mode in the CMC21 is changed to the anti ferro uh, 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 electric uh, M5 plus uh, dist uh, uh, mode. Um, we uh, here show the uh, string induced uh, property and uh, structure uh, and the structural changes uh, in CMC21. The polarization uh, increases with increasing the with varying the string from compressive to tensile, and uh, and uh, upon the transition, the uh, it, the polarization suddenly changes to the zero due to the uh, PMP uh, tra uh, P, uh, polar to non-polar transition. And uh, in the two phases, the OR angle decreases with increasing strain uh, uh, with, with, with the strain, while the OOT angle uh, uh, increases with the strain. And the, t, uh, the uh, titanium oxygen bond length, uh, uh, the implant titanium oxygen bond length incre uh, decreases with the strain. Uh, and the uh, outer plane TIO bond length uh, increases with the strain. And this due to the uh, back cell string effect. effect. Uh, this effect also decreases the C lattice parameter, and all these phenomena are, uh, are similar to those in the simple prose gas, except the PMP transition. Uh, next, I will talk about the uh, driving force for this PMP transition, and uh, like what happens for the gamma 5 polar mode in uh, CMC21, the, uh, anti ferro electric M5 mode, you know, anti ferro electric M5, M5 plus mode is itself is stable and uh, its, uh, its appearance is caused by the X, uh, X1 uh, minus mode combined with the X3 minus, uh, X3 minus mode. And due to the uh, hybrid improper mechanism in the two phases, we uh, first consider the um, changing of, the, uh, of these three. Uh, of these 
of the three antiferro distortive mode with the uh, with the string, and because uh, both uh, faces both faces have the uh, the same uh, have the x three minus mode, we just uh, we just need to consider uh, we just need to compare the x one minus uh, related faces with the uh, x two plus related faces. Uh, uh, I'll show you here. We uh, we find there is no crossover between the x one minus and x two plus uh, related faces. We uh, moreover the uh, x uh, the x one minus mode uh, x one minus mode related faces uh, always has a lower energy than this x one x two plus related faces. So uh, therefore we. Uh, uh, therefore, the competition between the competition between the x two plus and the x one minus uh, x one minus mode alone cannot cannot induce the transition. To further elucidate, uh, uh, to further uh, we uh, we then uh, using the Landau model, including the mode mode interaction and the trilinear related couplings to uh, to study the PMP transition. And um, uh, the model, uh, our model in this work is shown here. And uh, this, uh, we, uh, 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 by using this model, we also we can also obtain a phase diagram, and um, which is consistent with the direct uh, DFT calculation, uh, DFT uh, calculation obtained phase diagram, just with a small change in the critical transition value. Um, uh, so, uh, therefore, our Landau model yields a reasonable description of the CTO system with string. To further elucidate the PMP transition, we decompose this, uh, this uh, Landau model into two terms. The first, um, they are the AFD term, uh, indicated by the red box, and the AF, FE AFD term in CMC21, or uh, FE AFD term in CMC21, or AFE AFD term in uh, PBCN. Face uh, indicated by the purple box, and in the in this a, uh, FE AFD term or AFE AFD term, there exists a, uh, there exists a, a trilinear related terms expanded to the fifth order, indicated by the orange uh, dash line. Uh, before going to the before going to the uh, results, we I would like to introduce two new regions. Uh, uh, we divided the figure into uh, we divided the figure by the two uh, by the new regions because in S1 um, region the uh, F the FE mode is, is a hard mode, uh, where in the CM, uh, in the S2 mode the uh, it becomes soft. We um, we uh, we not, uh, uh, first let us see. Let, let, let us see the um, AFD contribution in the two phases with uh, with varying the stream. Um, in this figure, we can see the AFD contribution in CMC uh, in uh, PBC always uh, had uh, always uh, always uh, always had a larger uh, always la uh, is always larger than uh, than the AFD contribution in the CMC21 uh, phase. And uh, uh, f uh, uh, and and furthermore, we uh, the Contribution different, uh, difference between the two phases uh, is larger in compressive stream than that in the tensile stream. Um, in the second figure, we show the FE AFD contribution uh, or, uh, and the AFE uh, AFD contribution with varying uh, with varying uh, the stream. We find the FE uh, we find the um, uh, we, we, we find the FE AFD contribution. Um, is it, it, it large, it always larger than the, uh, than the uh, AFE AFD contribution uh, in the whole stream region, and uh, also uh, and uh, uh, and also the uh, both contribution becomes larger when the stream uh, when the when the stream varies from tens compressive to tensile. Uh, uh, what's more, the uh, FE uh, AFE AFD contribution. Uh, 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 increases rapidly uh, than the FE AFD contribution, and this result, uh, our uh, this result, it consists with the our prior's uh, our prior's uh, uh, our prior's investigation in which there is there is no mode mode interaction included. 
uh, to summarize uh, the findings from the two uh, figures, we, uh, we find in the compressive uh, phase boundary, the smaller, the, the smaller uh, FE, EFD contribution, uh, that, that is due to the less important, uh, uh, less important trilinear related couplings, uh, cannot support the uh, AF, uh, uh, AFD contribution in CMC21 to uh, uh, cannot support the computation of AFD contribution in CMC21 to, the, to that in the PBCN phase, uh, thus the uh, uh, compressive PNP transition occurs. Uh, in the tensile phase boundary, uh, we, uh, we find the, the due, due to the, uh, due to the, uh, the more rapid the increasing of the uh, AFE, AFD contribution uh, plus its AFD uh, contribution, the PB synthesis can be stabilized in the in a larger uh, tensile uh, string uh, re re region. Thus, we conclude that the AFE, uh, AFD contribution in CMC21 and uh, AFE, AFD contributions in PBC with string play, play an important role in achieving the PMP transition, which is due to the uh, trilinear related couplings, and that is the only term in this uh, contribution, lowering the energy. But lastly, we also studied the, we also studied the uh, dielectric response across the uh, phase boundary. What, uh, what, what is more interesting is that the tensile phase boundary, uh, we, uh, the, here the epsilon 2, uh, epsilon 2, 2 uh, between, uh, between, the two, uh, between the two phases had a larger uh, constant difference. We thus propose a possible tuning of the dielectric response by electric field at the tensile PMP transition. <coughs> so in this work, we first reported the uh, anticipated PMP, uh, tra uh, PMP transition in the CTO, uh, 001 CTO uh, films and uh, that may be a general feature in the double-layered RP, uh, RP, RP perovskite family exhibiting HF in bulk. Um, second, we explained the competition between the trilinear related couplings in uh, the two phases uh, with uh, in the two phases with stream plays a uh, very important role in the PMP transition. Finally, we propose a possible tuning of the dielectric response by the electric field at the tensile um, uh, face, uh, PMP phase boundary in the 001 CTO um, films. Uh, thank you. Okay, good. So we have time for one or two questions. Yes. Uh, let's say in the 3% strain where the, these two phase are degenerate in energy. Have you calculated the energy barrier between these two phases? Uh, no, we, I will do in the future work. Okay. Any other questions? All right, if not, let's thank our speaker once again. <laughs> Are there any announcements from the organizers? Or So just a reminder, we're going to do the photo shoot now, just before everybody goes to lunch. And uh, has anybody had any problem putting up a poster? Because a lot of the posters that are put up are too big and they're taking up an entire panel. I just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, <laughs> to put theirs up. So if there are no complaints, I guess we're okay. But just let me know if you do. All right, let's go get the post uh, photo taken.